Thank you, Colin. Um, I've, I've given uh, Colin and Mike um, liberty to uh, butt in and unmute themselves if I'm talking too fast or I've hit mute by accident or uh, anything strange like that. Um, but it's always good to be together. Uh, it's the first time I've spoken to you all on the computer in this way, but uh, I'm sure God will be with us nonetheless. Um, but this morning I'll be speaking about endurance. I want to give us an exhortation to endure. Um, and as with many words in the Bible, translating it into one English word doesn't capture the full meaning. Um, so the word endurance in most of the verses that we'll be considering can often be synonymous with perseverance. Um, so I might kind of use that term interchangeably. Um, so you just have to uh, forgive me. Um, and the word also contains elements of steadfastness constancy and patience. Uh, one definition for it in New Testament usage is someone who has not swerved from their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I'll just read that again. It's someone who has not swerved from their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Twice in the middle of the book of Revelation, there is a phrase that says, here is a call for the endurance or the perseverance of the saints. Uh, and this call is given in the midst of great tribulation and trial. And the second instance adds that the call is for those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Earlier in Revelation, in the letters to the seven churches, Jesus commends three of the churches for their patient endurance. And another he commends because they hold fast his name and did not deny his faith. Wouldn't it be wonderful 
if Jesus could commend us one day for our patient endurance. So I'd like to reiterate God's words in Revelation and his call for our endurance, our perseverance as his saints. I think a good question to ask is why? Why do we need perseverance? What do we need to endure? Or another way of looking at it is, what are the things that threaten our endurance? And I can see three main things. <clears throat> There's probably more, <clears throat> but I can see three main things that would hinder us in our efforts to patiently persevere. Three main threats to our endurance. And they are sin, deception, and suffering. That's sin, deception, and suffering. Um, and I think that self is tied up in each of these. Self and the love of self will lead us to want our own way, which may lead to sin. Um, a lack of self-discipline in reading and applying God's word or rejecting truth that is painful to self can cause us to be deceived and stray from the whole truth, from the narrow path. Our desire to preserve ourselves from pain, discomfort and suffering may break our endurance. Self can be very destructive to enduring in our walk with God. We must die to ourselves and surrender our lives to Jesus. We sang about the antidote in the hymn earlier. I'm just going to read um, the first verse and chorus. Jesus, let thy splendour like a mantle fall on this waiting spirit whilst I yield thee all. Clothe me with thy beauty, bathe me in thy will, and with life triumphant all my nature fill. Fellowship with Jesus, this is victory. They who own his lordship know true liberty. And I want to consider briefly these three threats to our patient endurance, sin, deception and suffering. In some verses, they all appear together, uh, but I'll try to look at them each in turn. Um, so first of all, if you want to follow in your Bible, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, um, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and from verse 1. Um, it's a bit harder for me to see if people are turning there, but I'll give you a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds if you, if you want to. So it's Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll just read the first few verses so it says therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely or which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. There are many things that can weigh us down, and sin is one thing that can really weigh heavily on us. For an endurance runner, what matters is keeping going and eventually finishing. Imagine running with weights tied around you or with a backpack full of weights. You would soon be worn out. And that's what sin will do. Sin will weigh us down, it will trip us up and it will wear us out. Let's not grow weary and faint-hearted. <clears throat> Let us fix our eyes on Jesus and consider what he has made available to us. He shed his blood for our sins so that we could be clean and so we could lay aside sin and things that weigh us down, giving it all to him so that we can run with endurance. Jesus is the best example to us, but the passage stated, Therefore, sin are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This is referring to all the heroes of faith in chapter 11. And I just want to pick one from there. So if you're still there, which I'm not actually, um, Hebrews 11 <clears throat> and verse 
24. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Can we be like Moses and choose to be mistreated as one of God's people rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin? Do we consider the reproach of Christ something to be valued and as greater wealth than the treasure of the world of Egypt? Is there anything of Egypt still clinging to us, still ensnaring us? We have to be watchful. We have to be on guard. We find that in the Bible, there are many, many verses that tell us this. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the day is evil. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. There are many more such verses. So we can see that God knows that it is an issue and he's given us many warnings. But as we have read, Because of Jesus, we can lay it all aside, all of that sin and wait to be free to run unhindered. Turning back to good biblical examples of endurance, one who's not in the Hebrews list, but is a great example, is Caleb. He was wholehearted in all that he did, and he endured a great deal. We read about him as one of the faithful spies in Numbers chapter 13, um, along with just Joshua. He then pops up again in the story in in the book of Joshua at 85 years old, and he's raring to go to claim his inheritance in the promised land and to fight off giants and any other enemy in the way. There are 45 years between these stories and Caleb ran his race with endurance in that time. There have been many opportunities to sin during that time and most of his contemporaries had fallen to one or other of these. Um, I want to just read an extract from a book. It's actually a book about Joshua, um, but no surprise it mentions Caleb, um, at least in one chapter. I'm just going to read some of it. I'm sorry it's, it's sort of a whole page worth, but um, I couldn't rephrase it in a better way. So it says, Caleb, he followed God wholly through the weary years that ensued. Amid the marchings and countermarchings, the innumerable deaths, the murmurings and rebellions, of the people. He retained a steadfast purpose to do only God's will, to please him, to know no other leader and to heed no other voice. It was of no use to try and involve that stout lion's cub in any movement against Moses and Aaron. He would not be party to Miriam's jealous fight. He would not be allured by the wiles of the girls of Moab. Always strong and true and pure and noble. And Caleb's devotion led to strength. Lo, said Caleb, I am this day four score and five years or 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Consecration is the source of undecaying strength. Because it allows the soul to draw on the strength of God, just as the sap flows through the ten divine branches in spring, so does the strength of God pass into those that believe, who are not only united to him, but fully surrendered and given up to his indwelling. It is this point that Isaiah emphasises in his sublime contrast between the respective strength of youth and of those that wait on Jehovah. He says, under circumstances that sap the vigour of early manhood so that youths faint and are weary and young men utterly fail, those that wait on the Lord renew their strength. They mount up on wings like eagles. They run 
and don't tire. They walk and are not faint. And it is the last of these that is so difficult. To go forward in the sultry heat, to have patience and bear for his name's sake and not grow weary. To resist the temptation to lethargy and luxurious ease. This is the greatest task of all. This would be Caleb's experience for 45 years of desert wandering. No human energy can suffice. The soul must learn to take the power which God gives to the faint and to receive the strength he increases to such as have no might. But this strength is accessible only through obedience. God cannot and will not bestow it except where there is a thoughtful and deliberate purpose to do his will, to follow his path and to execute his work. But if you are set on this, then adequate strength for body and soul, mind and heart, will and spirit shall most certainly be forthcoming. The outward man may decay, but the inward man will be renewed day by day. And this is a big part of the secret of not sinning. It's, it's fellowship with Jesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I want to now briefly consider how we need to endure in the face of deception and to persevere in God's word and the discernment of the truth. This is very important for us as God's people, especially in these days. This is also something that the Bible warns about a lot. Jesus says in Matthew, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. May God help us endure to the end and be saved and not to let our love grow cold. Jesus says, that we will be hated by all nations for his name's sake. That doesn't seem like a very good evangelistic strategy, does it? But are we ready to be hated because we believe in the Jesus of the Bible? There are many who bear the name Christian, who compromise God's word to make things more palatable to the world or even to themselves. Paul charged Timothy in his second letter to him, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Brothers and sisters, these things are already happening at a grand scale. I think that we would be shocked if we really knew the extent of it. We must be on our guard. We must love God's word and know it for ourselves. And that is the best defense. Get to know the genuine so well that it is not hard to spot a fake. Remember though, it can be subtle. It only takes a slight veering off the narrow path and further down the road, you are miles away. Paul writes in Romans 15, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I will say is, don't be lulled into error by being guilt-tripped into unity. We do want unity in the church of Jesus. Of course we do. But there can only be true unity in the true Jesus Christ. And we've been warned to be on our guard. Again, there are many verses along these lines that we're considering. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention 
as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The last thing uh, that I want to look at today is suffering. And this is something that we are called to endure. It's different from both sin and deception in that God may be its cause sometimes. Jesus said that in this world you will have trouble, but that we can take heart because he has overcome the world. During the Apostle Paul's conversion, Jesus told him that he would suffer many things for his name's sake. And Paul tells Timothy that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. It looks like suffering will be a fact of life at some point if we are Christians. This will need endurance. We're not called to an easy life. We're called to be like Christ. I recently heard a preacher saying that he believed that the calling of every Christian is to suffer unjustly. The calling of every Christian is to suffer unjustly. And he based this on 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 19. So if you want to turn there, I'm going to read that. 1 Peter chapter 2, from verse 19. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to reach that. So considering that the calling of every Christian is to suffer unjustly. So it says from verse 19, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer, um, sorry, if, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We are to follow Christ's example. He came to die for us and to pay for our sins, but he did come also to leave us an example of how to live. In the next chapter, Peter says, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So it can be God's will for us to suffer sometimes. This is something that we have to trust God with. And as we read, it is not good to suffer because of sin. That is not God's will. So we will need to endure suffering. But interestingly, Paul writes in Romans that we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character and character produces hope. Um, as we've seen, Paul suffered a lot. There's a few accounts of a lot of uh, the terrible things he suffered. But he also rejoiced a lot. He says in Colossians, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. This verse used to confuse me a lot. Lacking in Christ's afflictions, but he's paid it all. He suffered for us. It's finished. And so on. But I think that the answer lies in our calling to be like Jesus. Our calling to suffer unjustly. We are to show forth Christ to the world. We are to be his witnesses. It's not that there's anything missing from the complete work of the cross. We can't add anything to it. It's that God has chosen us, as he had chosen Paul, to bear Christ's image. Christ likeness and to present him to the world both in our words and in our beings. <clears throat> Everyone born after the cross cannot personally witness in the physical realm Jesus and his suffering for them. And as the body of Christ on this earth, God wants to use us 
to fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Something I read recently helped me understand this more. Paul saw his own suffering as the visible reenactment of the sufferings of Christ so that people will see Christ's love for them. There's a helpful comparison where Paul, writing to the Philippians, commends a man called Epaphroditus to them, saying that he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete or to fill up what was lacking in their service to him. This verse also used to confuse me. Um, I used to think, oh, that's a bit cheeky of Paul to tell them that their gift wasn't quite enough and that Epaphroditus had risked his life somehow to add the shortfall. But I just want to quote from what I read that helped me understand this passage better. The gift to Paul was a gift of the church as a body. It was a sacrificial offering of love. What was lacking was the church's presentation of this offering to Paul in person. This was impossible. And Paul represents Epaphroditus as supplying this lack by his affectionate and zealous ministry. In the same way, Christ has prepared a love offering for the world by suffering and dying for sinners. It is complete and lacks nothing except one thing, and that is a personal presentation by Jesus himself to the nations of the world or to the colleagues in your workplace. God's answer to the lack is to call us to present the afflictions of Christ to the world and so fill up what is lacking. Paul sees a close connection between his own sufferings and Christ's afflictions. God intends for the afflictions of Christ to be presented to the world on one level through the afflictions of his people. God means for the body of Christ, us, his church, to experience some of the suffering he experienced. So that when we offer the Christ of the cross to people, they see the Christ of the cross in us. We will not all be called to the same levels of suffering, but as Christ's body, we are called to suffer unjustly. It will be through our response as Christ-filled people. When reviled, we do not revile in return. When we suffer, we do not threaten. Through this, people will see Jesus. We may not have to suffer as Paul did or as some courageous men and women we read about in missionary biographies like Jim Elliot and his friends. But if we truly yield ourselves to God, there may well be unjust, summit, and sorry, unjust suffering coming our way sometime. It is a high calling and we need to patiently endure. I want to turn us to one more scripture before we finish. Um, it's also in Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 32. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and a binding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Are we able to endure a hard struggle with suffering or to joyfully accept the plundering of our goods without shrinking back? The days may be coming when we need to. But let us take heart. We can endure because Jesus endured, and he can strengthen us with the power of his might. If we wait upon the Lord, our strength will be renewed. I just want to finish by praying one of Paul's prayers from uh, one of his letters and adapting it for us. Um, so let's, let's pray together. Lord, we do not want to cease to pray 
asking that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that we may walk in a manner worthy of you, Lord, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May we be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to you, our Father, who have qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Um, there's some time now to, to respond. If, if anyone wants to respond, please, please do that now. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. So we need to keep our eyes on fixed on Jesus. That's what we heard, that's what we read, Lord. And we pray that you'd help us do that, Lord, each one of us, to fix our eyes upon Jesus every day. That we might endure, Father, that we might endure patiently. And when it comes that we might endure suffering, Father. Amen. Amen.